Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. Well, Legacy, what a joy to get to be with you all today. I have been praying for you. And you might not know this, but our church has a partnership with Legacy. Josh has been just a gift and a joy to get to know over the past several years. And, and uh, I just got to tell you, you are led by somebody that I hold in the highest regard and highest uh, esteem. That man uh, just keeps pouring his heart out, pouring his love out for you all. And whether you're the very first time visitor or guest here, we've been praying for you as well. I'm so honored that you are here today. As Josh mentioned, my name is Tom Hughes. I'm a lead pastor of a church called Christian Assembly in Eagle Rock and a great community out there. It's been around since 1907, believe it or not. And so we've been walking, uh, following Jesus as best we know how in the city of LA for quite some time. Well, I love vacation. I just came off a of vacation. Maybe you had some time to get away for a little bit of time in the, the summer. So my wife and I and our three kids, we were planning our vacation. And recently I was buying the airline tickets. We were going back to the East Coast so we could see her folks and spend some time with them. And I was in the midst of buying these uh, airline tickets. And I had five tickets to purchase. My wife, myself, our three kids. And so that means every little fluctuation in the cost of the ticket matters times five. So I'm in the midst of booking these airline tickets. I find the ones that I want to use and I want to go to that location at that time. And in the midst of it, with this particular website, the price of the tickets changed while I was booking them. I hadn't yet gotten all the way through for the confirmation. It didn't just change. It changed, remind you, times five. And of course, as you can imagine, Murphy's Law, the announcement that popped up on the splash screen was not that the tickets became cheaper. They all went up a little bit in price. And so then I decided, look, I, I got to book them because they might just keep going up over time. So I booked them anyways. Of course, about a week later, after I had booked these airline tickets, I receive an email alerting me to the fact that the exact same price, uh, flight to the exact same location on the exact same days had now dropped in price, right? And yet I called, and they don't have that particular airline, didn't have a uh, price guarantee. And I, and I was left feeling with like, man, I, I overpaid for something. Don't you hate when you find out that you overpaid for something? It just feels like in our culture, our society, what something is worth is constantly changing. It's constantly up for grabs, whether it's an airline ticket, whether it's the price of a gallon of gas, whether it's a share of a stock, it feels like what is worth what? It's constantly changing. It feels like that because it is like that. What is something actually worth? It's a question that all of us have to answer. It's fundamental in our life. Knowingly or unknowingly, we answer that question every single day. And so today, we're going to look at two little parables that Jesus told about deciding what is worth what. Before we consider them, let's pray. So God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace, your mercy, and the truth of your word, that you come through your word to meet us fresh with your spirit. So God, I pray now, would you meet all of us, myself included, as we come to your word? God, would you build us up? Lord, I pray maybe those who are here who don't know you, that you would draw them to yourself through your word. Those who know you, would you give us a deeper understanding and a deeper affection for you and a deeper desire to follow your good plan for our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you brought a Bible with you, uh, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew 13. That's where you'll find these. We're going to begin in verse 44. If you didn't bring one, oh, it's okay. I'll be reading uh, the parables to us. So I have a lot of ground that I want to cover today, but I believe as we do this that God is going to give us fresh faith today. About one-third of Jesus' teachings came to us in the form of a parable. So if you want to know Jesus, you're going to have to wrestle with the parables. In fact, that word parable in the Hebrew, it means a riddle, and in the Greek, the word means to throw something alongside something else. And so when Jesus would 
uh, tell a parable, he was throwing something, a riddle along something else. And what is the something else that he was throwing it alongside? He's throwing it alongside our lives, even here, even today, even this morning. So here are two short riddles that Jesus throws alongside our lives today. Matthew 13, 44, Jesus is speaking. He says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again, sold everything he owned to get enough to buy money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. Now, these parables are about determining what is worth what. That much is clear. But if we want to get into this parable and really understand what God might want to be saying to us this morning, you have to determine in these parables who is what. In other words, in these parables, as you read these parables, does God intend you to understand yourself as the man or the treasure? Or does God understand, uh, intend for you to understand yourself as the pearl or the merchant? And how you answer that question is going to have radical consequences, both on how you understand yourself and view yourself, as well as how you understand God and view God, and how you understand how the kingdom of God functions in our lives. So I want to bring you on a journey through God's word that I've been on that started with these two simple parables. I started pulling on a thread from God's word and found in the scriptures, and all I can tell you is it didn't lead me where I thought it should go or even thought it would go. So come with me. All of Matthew 13, we read just a little snippet there, is basically a running list of Jesus telling these stories, these parables. But just prior to Jesus telling these parables, Matthew tells us this. He says this, Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This prophecy fulfilled, uh, this fulfilled the prophecy that said this, I will speak to you in parables and I will explain, get this, mysteries hidden since the creation of the world. Well, if these parables are about mysteries that have been hidden since the creation of the world, it's wise for us to go back to Genesis, the very first book in the Bible which tells us about the creation of the world. Now, as we go to Genesis, remember, we are asking ourselves, what is worth what? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says this, Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then in verse 31, God saw that all he made, and it was very good. That Hebrew word there that is translated good, it can also be translated as precious or valuable or excellent and pleasing. So if we go back to the very beginning of creation, during the initial stages of the creation of the world, who is it that is called very good, very pleasing, very valuable, very excellent? It's me. And it's you. Because you've been created in God's image. That, that very precious, that very valuable nature, it comes from the fact that you were created in the image of God. God looks at you and he says, you are good. In fact, you're not just very good. Uh, you're not just good. You're very good. You are very precious. You are very pleasing and you are very valuable. So what we see from Genesis is this, is that image gives and determines value. We still live by this truth today in our own economy. Consider this bill that I have with me. This bill's de uh, value is not determined by its shape or its size or its color. It's not determined by where it's been or what it's done. If you want to know what this bill is worth, you need to know whose image is on it. And if you're like me and you have some bills in your wallet, I always hope when I open up my wallet and I look in at these bills that are in there, I like George, I like George's image, I like Andrew's image, but really I want to see Benjamin on the bills inside my wallet, right? That's the best image to have on the bill that is in your wallet. Now, how do you determine what this bill is worth? You need to know whose image is on it. So how do you determine what you are worth? You need to know 
whose image is on you. So here's what's true of you this morning. Regardless of what you think of yourself today, regardless of whether you're having a great day or a glum day, whether things are going really well or not going well at all, you were created in the image of God. Maybe you're here and you're like, look, I don't even know what I think about God. I don't even know what I think about Jesus. I don't even know what I think about all this stuff. God still created you in his image. He still gave you the highest value that you could have, that you are very precious, that you are very excellent. Now, we live in a world where nothing seems to have constant and absolute value. We live in kind of a value democracy where everything seems to be up for grabs, whether you're talking about airline tickets or stocks or homes or the it toy from last year's Christmas. It seems like everything is up for a vote, and that is the nature of capitalism. Now, just to be clear, I'm in favor of capitalism when it comes to economics, but here's the real problem. Many of us begin to absorb our economic reality, and we make that our view of all reality. We begin to think that our value is relative, changing whether our friends or our family or our boss thinks that we're valuable. We begin to think that maybe our value changes based off of how many Instagram followers we have or whether you got the grade that you wanted to get on that final exam or whether you sealed the deal with that client or whether you got the year-end job review that you wanted to get. But how do you determine what you're worth? You need to know whose image you bear. And here's what's true of you. You are not a George. You are not an Andrew. You are not even an Abe Lincoln. You, according to God's word, are Benjamin. You have the highest value. You were given the highest value. Now, not only did God imprint his image on you, but then he named your value in Genesis. He said, wow, look look at him. Look at her. She is precious. He is precious. They're very good. What a gem. Every other time in Genesis, whenever God creates something, he calls it good. But when he creates humanity, he doesn't just say it's good. He says, you're very good. Now, this can be a challenge for some of us to accept because we're so ingrained in a culture to live where things have a constantly changing value. But the thing is, you're not a thing. See, that's the thing. Now remember what Matthew told us for a moment. Matthew told us that there was a prophecy that the Messiah would speak to us in parables, that he would explain mysteries hidden since the creation of the world. So then Jesus tells us a parable about a treasure, about something of great value that's hidden in the dirt. Now both the prophecy as well as the first parable speak of hiddenness. The parable tells us that it's something of great value. The prophecy tells us that it's something that has been hidden since the creation of the world. Now, how is it that something of great value ends up hidden since the creation of the world? Well, for that, we have to go to Genesis 3, where we learn that Adam and Eve, those created in the image of God, let fear take root in the deepest places of their heart. They listened to the enemy of God who came and told them essentially that our creator is not good, but instead that he's a vicious exploiter. And once this this little bit of mistrust possessed their minds and hearts, what do the humans do? Well, in Genesis 3, verses 8 to 10, it tells us, it says this, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But then the Lord called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. So God comes and he says, Benjamin, oh Benji, where are you? And Benjamin, he, he says, oh my goodness, I'm naked and I'm afraid I better hide, and maybe, maybe I should just get buried down here. Maybe I should just get down here in the dirt and the muck and the messiness and the evil and the sin of life. Maybe the best thing for me to do is get as far away from God as I can get. So now what we have 
from Genesis 3 is that God is now looking for something precious that is now hidden since the creation of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was sitting in a coffee shop thinking about this with God's word in front of me, all of a sudden the parable started to open up to me in a very unexpected way. See, but now, in the creation story, Adam and Eve, who trusted fear rather than goodness, they, they've begun to see threats everywhere. And as a result of their fear and as a result of their sin, they and also we and our sin and our fear, we proceed to unmake the lovely creation that came from the divine hand. Their totally false perception of who God is and how God works now begins to threaten to destroy God's dream of sharing his joy for the creatures that he created, for the joy of his affection created in his image, those that are dearly precious to him. How could God's light be shed once again in this now dark and suspicious place in the human soul? What is worth what? About a thousand years after Jesus told these two parables, there was a French guy named Bernard de Clairvaux who wrote something that helped shine some insight, I believe, onto these parables for me. Bernard was actually a leader of monks, and so that means that he got to observe the spiritual development of literally thousands of people. He didn't just oversee one monastery, he started almost a hundred of them. And I don't know much about monks. The main thing I know about monks is they apparently like to wear burlap robes sometimes. And the other thing that I know about monks is that they're pretty intent with their life on discovering what is worth what. Now, after observing hundreds, if not thousands of lives trying to discover what is worth what, Bernard de Clairvaux observed that there seems to be a four-stage development in a person's relationship with God. See if you can find yourself at any of these stages as a way of finding your way forward in your relationship with God. Stage one, he said, was this, the love of self for the sake of self. Bernard said that we all start out here, that we're all born here, that we're concerned only for ourselves. We're aware only of our own needs. I have three children, and none of them, whenever they were born, said, you know what, Dad, I know you're tired tonight. I'll just sleep through the night. I, it'll be okay. I know that you've got needs. You've got to work in the morning, and so I'm not going to scream and cry in the middle of the night. Dad, I know that you don't necessarily love changing diapers all the time, so I'm going to get potty trained by the age of one month so that you don't have to deal with that. No, we all start out with a completely self-centered view of the world. We have no choice but to begin our lives in an entirely self-centered reality, but we don't have to stay there. So stage one, the love of self for the sake of self. Stage two is this, the love of God for the sake of yourself. This happens when we begin to be awakened to outside realities that are bigger and more powerful than ourselves, but the focus, notice, is still on ourselves. Now we love God, but we only love God on the basis of what God could do for us. So Bernard said that in his observation, for most people, this is as far as they ever travel in their life. And if you're wondering if that's you, like, how do I know if I'm in stage two? This is what he said. He said, listen to your prayers. If your prayers mainly consist of, give me this, protect me from that, grant me this, bless me in this way, I want this desire, then you are probably here, is what he said. You see, if our love for God stops here, then we run the risk of, hating God if he doesn't give us what we want, when we want. Just a personal note, I remember when I was first reading some of his writings that it hit a little too close to home. I opened up my prayer journal and I realized like, man, a lot of my prayers are just about give me, bless me, protect me, 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 me. Stage three, he said, was this, the love of God for God's sake. Now, this is a quantum leap forward. This is where a person senses that God has value, not just because of what he has done for us or for you, but simply because of the very nature of who God is intrinsically. And this can be, begin the beginning of joy and wonder and depth of worship begins to happen. God didn't have to be the way that he is, but that such a God does exist becomes the focus of one's delight. That God is so creative that he created an animal like 
the platypus is remarkable. Even though the platypus might serve no purpose in my life, I can begin to take wonder in the creativity, the majesty, the joy, the power, the mercy of God. See, God didn't have to be the way that God is. And the fact that he is that way becomes the focus of worship. Now, I kind of thought that that would be the end of the stages. I mean, if we could ever get to the point that we love God for the sake of God, solely for who God is, then it seemed to me like that should be the top of the mountain. But I was surprised to find that there was a fourth stage. The fourth stage is this, the love of yourself for the sake of God. Now, I was shocked at this at first. It seemed selfish, it seemed arrogant, it seemed prideful. It seemed like we were taking a step backwards, not forward. But as a pastor, I've gotten the privilege to sit with many people in my life. And I just want to tell you, you already probably know this, but it is pretty rare to find a person who doesn't suffer from some point of blatant self-dislike. There are probably things that you can think of about yourself that you wish were different, that you don't really like about yourself. And I'm not just talking about sins that you've done. I'm talking about other things where you're like, you know, I wish I was taller. I wish I had this skill, that ability. I, I wish I was smarter. I wish I was funnier. I, I wish, I wish, I wish. I wish I had a different spiritual gift. I wish I had that, that thing that I thought would just make me complete. And so what begins to happen is, in that blatant self-dislike, we can sometimes begin to feel like, I wonder if God knew what he was doing when he made me. See, I'm convinced that there are many among us who do not seem to believe that God really did know what he was doing when he created us. It's kind of like, well, he, he created me, and I guess he just has to put up with me now. And I want to tell you that if you came here this morning and you've ever struggled with negative feelings towards yourself, it's a pretty surprising discovery to find out how God feels about you, how God thinks about you. What is worth what? It seems the value of airline tickets and everything else is constantly moving and changing. And if that's the case, then how can we really know what something is worth? Here's how you know what something is really worth. It's worth what someone is willing to pay for it. Jesus tells us two parables about what the kingdom of God is like and how you understand how the kingdom of God will operate in your life will depend on whether you think of yourself as the man or the treasure, the, mer the, the, the merchant or the pearl. So you might be tracking with me and you might be saying, so Tom, are you saying that we are the treasure? Are you saying that we are the pearl? Here's what I'm saying. In all of the other parables of Jesus that have a man, a merchant, or a person who is searching for something that is hidden, covered, or lost, God is not the one who is hidden, covered, or lost. We are. And God is the one who is doing the searching. God is the one who is on the look for the thing of great value, of great price, which has been hidden, which has been buried. Christ is the one who comes, and he's looking through all of our sin, but he still sees our value in spite of all of our brokenness, our, our messiness, our value-distorting fears, our, our sin that we've covered ourselves in. Christ is the one who sets aside, as Philippians 2 tells us, his divine rights like a man who sells everything, coming as a baby in the manger, heading to the cross for the joy that was set before him. And what does that joy consist of? It consists of the restoration of an unbroken communion that we were created to have with God from the creation of the world. What is worth what? God declares that you are worth the arrival of his son, Jesus Christ, who arrives in the manger to be with us. In fact, in Luke chapter 1, verse 68, tells us that Jesus visited his people. I hate that translation. The word visited there, it, it loses some of, some of the thunder of the original word. The original word in the Greek is that Jesus episkepitoed his people. He episkepitoed us. Epi is a prefix, and that means in Greek to move towards someone or something with helpful intent. And skepito? That's where we get our word skeptic from. 
In other words, Jesus' coming was God's move towards all of us skeptics. But he doesn't come because he's angry. He comes because he's full of love. He comes with helpful intentions. Jesus' is coming in the manger is God declaring that you are worth it. Now, what happens is we think this. Well, what about my sin? What about my messed up life? What about my addiction? What about my secrets? Don't those remove my value to God? And this is one of the most infuriating lies from the pit of hell to me. See, what the enemy does, because he's always a liar, is that the enemy first comes and tells us to believe lies about God, which he knows will cause us to then hide in the dirt and the muck and the mire of sin. And then when we're down there and we're hiding in the dirt and we're hiding in the muck and we're hiding in the sin, the enemy now comes and he whispers another lie to us, only this lie isn't about God. This lie is about ourselves. He comes in our messed up, broken, shameful, sinful state and he says, you know, you were valuable to God once when you were clean, when you didn't have any tracks in your arm. Whenever you didn't do that thing that you had pledged that you would never do again, when you were not afraid, when you were not in hiding, you were valuable to God, but now, but now you've blown it. See, you're all messed up now. You're you're all dirty. You're all broken. All of that is still with you. Your value to God, it's, it's gone now. God doesn't value messed up, dirty, broken sinners. And I'm here this morning to tell you, no, 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 no. Do not believe that lie about yourself or about God. Think of it this way. How much is a crisp, clean $100 bill worth? Not rhetorical. How much is it worth? 100 bucks, right? How much is this now crumpled up, still has dirt on it, has spent some time down in the soil? How much is this crumpled up, dirty, hidden $100 bill worth? It's worth 100 bucks. Why? Because the image, the image that's there, it might be dirty, it might be broken, it might be messy, it might be in need of some repair and recovery, but the image, the image is still there. See, while we were in the dirt and the sin and the muck and the mire, mire and the evil and the fear and the anger and the brokenness we cover ourselves with, he not only comes looking for you, but he pays the highest price for you. Isaiah 53 says it this way in verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole again. By his bruises we are healed. And in doing so, he episkeptos us. He comes towards us with a helpful intent. We're skeptical. We don't know how God's going to be and what he's going to be like and what his character is really like. But Jesus comes, and Jesus is God's answer to a bad reputation. Jesus comes and says, you want to know what the Father's like? Take a look at me. Come out of hiding. Don't listen to the lies anymore. Don't be a skeptic anymore of my good intentions and my good plans for you. I am good and I love you. You were precious to me when I created you. And even when you went into hiding, believing the lies of the enemy, you never lost your value to me. In fact, your hiding only caused me to double down on how much I love you and how much I value you and how much I want to restore you to the dreams that I have for you. Now, I know the interpretation that I am offering of these parables is not the standard interpretation. Maybe you've never been around church before. You're like, I don't even know what the standard interpretation is. Well, this isn't it, what I'm telling you. Maybe you have been around church before. You're like, I don't know that this guy knows what he's talking about. The standard interpretation is this. This is what I have always been taught. I was even taught this in seminary. I had graduate professors teach me what I believe now is the wrong interpretation of these parables. Here's how they would teach it. They would say, listen, here's what this parable means. God's kingdom is the pearl, and we have to pay our all to purchase it. We have to give our all to win God's best according to that view. And I get why that works to motivate us. I just don't think it's the gospel of Jesus. 
That way of understanding the parable, it makes you and I the hero of the story. That the story is about, look, God, at all that we've done for you. Look at all we did in our lives in order to purchase entrance into the kingdom. We make it all about what we've done and what we've paid rather than what God has done and what God has paid. The other problem that I have with that interpretation is that every single time the New Testament uses the word bought, you and I were not the ones doing the buying. Instead, we are told that in Christ, you were bought with a price. We have that in 1 Corinthians 6 and Acts 20 and 2 Peter 2, 1. In fact, there's only one time I could find in the entire New Testament where someone tried to buy something in the kingdom of God. Somebody tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit, and that person got rebuked. Plus, consider this. In Revelation 21, last book of the Bible, the city of God's described. And in that description, it contains 12 gates. And on the 12 gates are written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. What's interesting is what the gates are made of. Each of the gates are made of a single pearl. In other words, the pearls have people's names written on them, not God's name. Now this image of the pearl It's a powerful image. Did you know that the pearl is unique amongst all the precious stones in creation because it it is the only precious stone that is created through the process of pain? It's the result of a grain of sand creating pain within a clam that then secretes a fluid that hardens around the grain of sand. So when we see a pearl, we see something that has been made lovely and valuable and beautiful through the process of someone's pain. And that's, that's the very story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, we are forgiven. We are healed We are renewed. We are created anew. We are made beautiful again. And it happened through the process of his freely entering in to the pain of the cross for us and for our salvation. You see, the 12 pearls with the names of the 12 tribes is not saying that the good news is only available to Israel. God's word is clear that the mystery of the good news is now available to all who hear and to all who will respond by faith. So let me ask you, what is worth what? What God thinks you're worth is clear and unwavering. You're worth everything to him. You are the pearl of great price that he's come searching for. But now God, this morning, he puts the question back to us. Because remember, these parables, they were always riddles thrown alongside our lives. They were always something for us to wrestle with and something for us to respond to. They invite a response. What is worth what to you? We don't just show it by our prayers and our words. We show it by making real choices to change our actions because we see how much God really does love us, how good he really is, and the purposes and plans he's created us for. We don't do this because we're trying to buy something from God. We do this because in Christ, we've already been bought with a price. And what I can tell you is since the day that I started following Jesus over 24 years ago, I can tell you this, that that which has been paid for me is of greater value than anything he will ever ask me to pay to the kingdom.